Rocky Horror Minute is rated R. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is also rated R. We're going to spend this time discussing the movie in gory detail, and along the road we will talk about some adult content and use some of our favorite swear words. No, you can't. There must be another way. Do you want to stop State from getting that stone or not? (laughs) Consider yourselves warned. Welcome to Rocky Horror Minute, the podcast where we break down the Rocky Horror Picture Show in excruciating detail, one minute at a time. I'm one of your hosts, Leandra. And I'm your other host, Kelly. And today we are joined again by a very special guest, a good friend of mine and better friend to Kelly, the webmaster of our imaginary website, Brad Monroe. <laughs> oh, man. Hello, hello. Brad, before we drop in to our discussion of the minute, last minute you said I forced you into playing Riff. <laughs> I don't recall any of that. Oh, you can don't? You, can, no, not even a little bit. Can you talk about that? And just your general experience on a Rocky cast? (laughs) Well, yeah, so I think at that point I had been doing um, tech for a little bit. Um, So I was like kind of familiar with how the show worked outside of being an audience member because it is a very different thing to be sitting in the theater um, and watching the show than to be a part of making sure things happen correctly. And the night that I started playing Riff, um, it was because we had a much beloved cast member call out like 15 minutes before the show. And you were like, Brad, Brad, I need a Riff. Do you want to be Riff? You should be Riff. Brad, you should be Riff. You should do it. And then I... um, Agreed, and that is the most I can tell you of that night. I'm pretty sure I blacked out for most of it. I vaguely remember doing the kicks during Time Warp, but everything else I was, like, not there. But it was fun. I will throw it out there that if you had said no, I would have moved down the list. Oh, no, I... I did genuinely think. I I know, I know. I am using a forced in an endearing way. Okay. Well, that's that's good. I don't remember that, but that does check out. So often I will cast somebody and they'll go, remember how I said I was definitely going to be there? That was a lie. And then I'm kind of stuck scrambling at the last minute. So people who are down to, to jump in are often my new best friends. Yeah, I um I had to go around the cast um, begging for costume pieces and what we had in the prop room. I felt like a little Victorian orphan. <laughs> Kelly's type. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> sad but true. No, her her type is like that freak from Clockwork Orange. No. It can be both. They're really the same person. Yeah, that's true. Well, he's not that sickly looking. The one one time I'm so proud about roasting Kelly was we were driving somewhere, and no offense to this guy, I'm sure he's a wonderful person, but there was the most Point Dexter-est looking guy walking down the side of the road, <laughs> and I was like, hey Kelly, there's a guy you'll sleep with. <laughs> <laughs> it was true <laughs> because I was already looking at him being like damn <laughs> <sighs> that's great Kelly you have a type and it's people I can murder this is kind of a self own although I, I don't know if Leandra could murder me except maybe with like by doing puppy dog eyes no Brad's off script yeah, off model for me. Yeah, Brad's got cake for farting on, I guess. <laughs> and I am dating <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> oh man. This is so much more fun to talk about than minute 68. <laughs> oh, minute 68. Uh remind me again what happens in that, Kelly? Whole lot of nothing. Here we go. So, Dr. Scott continues singing He was born. We see Frank kind of fold his fingers and feign interest. So Scott continues, He was trouble. 
He was the thorn. And then we see Brad and Janet look really uncomfortable in his mutter's side. She tried in vain. And then we get a shot of Rocky gnawing away and not caring about this at all, which would be me. Uh, and then it cuts to Krim, who is looking at a recreation of a famous painting that you probably know by the wrong name. The correct name is Arrangement in Gray and Black, number one. More about that later. I'm really annoying about it. Anyway, but this is not the actual painting. It's a photo with meatloaf in it. More about that later, too. Uh, and then Krim says, but he never caused her nothing but shame. And then Scott continues, he left home the day she died. Um, the trio at the head of the table, Riff, Magenta, and Frank look very bored, but Magenta is kind of like feigning sympathy, like sarcastically, I always felt like, while uh, rubbing her nipple with her middle right finger. And then uh, Scott continues, from the day she was gone, and then the music picks up, uh, it gets a lot faster, or like more up-tempo and more fun, and then Scott really starts to boogie along with the music. He's sort of... Um, moving his shoulders to the beat and going side to side. Uh, and he continues, all he wanted was rock and roll porn. And then we see a shot of the crim book. And in the crim book, there's an image of a record uh, produced by Acme Records called Teddy Bear. And there is a porn mag called Tonight with uh, titties out on that, which I thought was interesting because... Um, we often say that Columbia is the only boobs in this movie, but no, actually, I mean, technically, whoever's on the cover of Tonight uh, also shows her boobs in this movie. And then Scott adds, und a motorbike, and then it flips to, like, an Evil Knievel-style, like, motorcycle stunt pick. Uh, and then there's also, we've talked about this when Larry Vizel was on the podcast a million years ago, but there is a rare as yet nobody has found this magazine but it's called rat bike of the month uh and then there is one called choppers another motorcycle magazine and then there is a flip to the next page which shows presumably eddie's fingerprints and uh there is an amazing photo of uh meatloaf for uh, you know it's obviously supposed to be eddie doing like something with a belt or something in his mouth. Leandra, do you know what this photo is supposed to be depicting? Yes. Yes, I do. Woohoo! Good, because I was actually really curious. Um, do you want to continue with your your thing, or do you want to... Well, we're, we're pretty much at the end, so yeah, I'll just say um, he adds shooting up junk, uh, and then Krim shows now Eddie's mug shots, and adds... He was a low-down, cheap little punk. And then Scott says, Taking everyone for a... And that's the end of the, the minute. So, what is that photo, Leander? It is Eddie shooting up junk. He has the belt oh, around the arm. Like... And if you look, there's oh. a needle in there. Um, and okay. he's been caught doing that. So his arm is up like, Hey, don't take a picture of this. I'm, I'm doing Got something it. nefarious. With my body. I wondered, I wondered if the belt was to do with shooting up junk, but I did not, first of all, did not see the needle and also did not intuit that storyline of, like, why his arm was up, because that is not the typical shooting up junk pose. But thank you, yeah. Yeah. It's a great photo. Uh, really fun. A cute little candid. So, yeah, before we go too much further, I just want, I want to bitch about something that is just... A personal annoyance of mine which the f the painting that many people know as Whistler's mother or like portrait of the artist's mother is not that is not the title and Whistler really really hated when people called it that it is called arrangement in grand black and then later they added number one because he did another arrangement in grand black that was almost exactly the same that uh, Thomas Carlyle sat for 
but yeah, it's, it, I know many people call it that, um, this is something that, uh, that he wrote in his book, The Gentle Art of Making Enemies. He said, take the picture of my mother exhibited at the Royal Academy as an arrangement in gray and black. Now that is what it is. To me, it is interesting as a picture of my mother, but what can or ought the public to care about the identity of the portrait? So basically, Whistler wanted, Whistler did not want people to look at this painting with the context of thinking about it being his mother and like connecting that to the artist. He wanted it to just be like, he wanted it to be like a blank slate for you basically. Um, so that's why it kind of bothers me when people call it, you know, Whistler's mother, but everyone calls it that. Richard O'Brien called it that in the commentary. I know I need to get over it, but I won't. Um, you, also, you don't have to get over it. You could dime out about it. I think I shall. Uh, Whistler did. So why not, <laughs> why not I? Um, <laughs> to Whistler, who died as he lived. <laughs> Mad that people kept calling his painting by the wrong name for no reason. Yeah, uh, we love this. But anyway, uh, I think it's interesting that this painting is often... It's often, I often hear it mentioned at the same time as like American Gothic, people connect the two, uh, which is interesting because that is another painting that was obviously really prominently referenced in this movie. I think that they both just feel very Americana. Yeah, definitely. And that's why, I mean, Richard O'Brien, especially as a foreigner, or, well, I guess might not have even been him. It was probably Brian Thompson, to be honest. Um, but even, but he's also a foreigner, so I wonder if that's, at the time, if that's, like, what came to mind when people thought about America and American art. I really wish that we had more pictures of the photo shoot of Meatloaf sitting for this, because yeah. I, this is a story that I've heard many times over the years, but I wasn't able to trace it back to anything of he sat for this because he was upset that he couldn't do drag as Dr. Scott like he did for the stage play. He was still incredibly bitter that he was only Eddie. So he was like, fine, I'm still going to be in drag. It doesn't matter if nobody notices. I'm still going to do it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's true, but that is at least a thing that I've heard from multiple people over the years. So maybe. Yeah, I have heard that too. And it does kind of, um, it kind of strikes me as apocryphal, but it's a really fun idea. And also I like that. And this is another reason that it would have been great if Meatloaf was pl also playing Scott because it's another joke of like, because I assume that's supposed to be, you know, Eddie's mother, and it's another joke of, like, Meatloaf is playing all his family members, you know? I think it's supposed to be Eddie's mother because the the line is, uh, but he never caused her nothing but shame. Yeah, I assumed. And so, because of that, you know, it would have been even funnier if if they had preserved that joke with Dr. Scott, but yeah. Eddie's whole family was just like a uh, like muscle man's family from the regular show. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I also, I thought it was fun that they had Krim. I assume it was like, it was like Krim was imitating uh, Dr. Scott's like grammar. Because I don't think he would normally say he never caused her nothing but shame. And my theory for that would be that probably that was originally a Scott line in the show, or I'm almost certain it was, because Krim, Krim isn't in the show, right? No, he is. Oh, he is. All right. Well, is that a is that a Krim line in the Rocky Horror Show? So, interestingly enough, yes, but it's, it's a little bit complicated because, hypothetically, the song wasn't included in the 1973 original London cast recording because the album was recorded before Charles Atlas' song and that's because that among other songs was added to the show later 
So yeah, I've got more about that. I'm saving for when we're raiding. I'm very excited. Ooh. Yeah, a little preview. I like how um aggro Krim is saying his lines. He is like fucking pissed. I don't really understand yeah. why, but um I love the energy. <laughs> Charles Gray seems to feel a deep sympathy for, I guess, Eddie's mother, which makes sense because he seems like he would hate ne'er do wells. Yeah. That criminologist, definitely not a cool guy. Very anti drugs and sex and rock and roll, and, and possibly not that order. And yet he <laughs> keeps titty pics in his binder, curious. Yeah, I never thought about that until I was analyzing this minute. I always say that, like, that's the only nudity in the film, but not true. Columbia. I always say Columbia is the only nudity in the film, but but no. There's a titty pick. If Joe Bob Briggs were doing his uh, drive-in totals for this, he would count... Three titty... Well, four. Well, yeah, I know. I'm now thinking, I guess... I guess six... Because we see one nipple from Columbia twice. Oh, yeah. And then we see both of her nipples, and then we see this uh, mystery lady's nipples. Her whole ass honkers. Mm hmm. Ass honkers. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight on Ass Honkers. <laughs> is that like a. Uh, but that's all I have. A show like Milf, Milf Hunter from 30 Rock? <laughs> yeah. Shout out to our friend Mike, not Leandra's fiance Mike. Oh. But he's a milk hunter. <laughs> the bald one. Yes. Oh. Oh? I don't know this you person. You don't know this person. Okay. But if you were a MILF, you would. <laughs> if you're a MILF in the Carnally. If you're a MILF in the tri state <laughs> area or I guess around Vegas, um <laughs> Yeah. Um, or in Amsterdam. That's true. Yeah. We love this. This is good content. <laughs> it is, I know. I mean, listen, I'm out of content for the movie, so y'all can go crazy talking about it. <laughs> I, was, I was really looking for stuff to make commentary on, and I've gotten so deep that, like, I noticed Riff has, like, mm -hmm. a red, like, cut or line or something on his chest that you can see when he leans in. I don't know if that's, like, a makeup effect or what. It's there. It's makeup. Okay. Yeah, he's got blood on his chest and on his on his vest as well. Okay. Oh, uh, I guess I, I wonder yeah. if that's implying that he has dismembered Eddie for serving. Delicious. Spoilers. Spoiler. Ugh. Spoilers. Ugh. <laughs> Talk about things that make me angry like it's a swear spoilers sweetie Sp spoilers or people getting mad about spoilers specifically saying spoilers in that way and if you're a whovian you damn well know what you've done oh well i'm not so i'm gonna go get laid <laughs> <laughs> but not with brad because he is a whovian David Tennant's a wonderful actor. Yes. He is a wonderful actor. No arguments here. Man, if David Tennant were in this... I was just thinking the same thing. I actually think he do, could do a really good Frank, I believe. I think so. He also could be fun as, like, Brad. Oh, I could see that. Riff. Actually, he could do Riff, I think. An incredibly murderable Eddie. <laughs> Whoa, Kelly. Uh, Kelly. No, Calm I know. Hey, hey, no, I can't. I'm already stripping down. Like you're like you're wearing clothes. <laughs> That's just so unfair to say. Uh, I do have other notes. Okay, let's hear them. Okay. So yet again, Peter Henwood is greased up in a sexy, sexy way, but if you're at a dining room table with that lighting it just makes you look sweaty and gross. So it is It is less and less likely that anybody could find him attractive. <laughs> I love the thought of Brad just staring at this greasy, filthy man and going, why did you get it? How did you get it? 
I, I feel like I have more to offer. You know what I mean? So that's why he's upset. Realistically, um, Rocky has uh, fucked around twice at this point, so I think he... And I guess run around in the dirt and rain, too, so being a sweaty, dirty Frankenstein man is probably more accurate for the, uh, the vibe. I think he looks great in this scene, though. I don't know what you're talking about, Leandra. I... I am very gay, so... Yeah. yeah. Oscar knows what I'm talking about. He doesn't like men with too many muscles. <laughs> Just one big one yeah. and it's inside of him. <laughs> Oscar saying, bottom? I'm not a bottom. <laughs> to nobody. <laughs> Oscar pretending like someone called him a bottom so that he could argue with them. That was one of my favorite Oscar moments. It was really a... He might have cribbed that from you, like, at your parties when you're like, we should play Kings. Who said that? <laughs> I do love playing Kings. We should play Kings instead of talking about this movie anymore. My next note about this movie. <laughs> Fine. I, I wonder why Dr. Scott keeps moving his head to face other people specifically in this it's very clear that the direction he got was make sure that you're you're including as many people as possible in your storytelling so on every single line he intentionally moves his head to face somebody else so it's facing frank for trouble facing brad and janet for mother's side then back to Rocky, then back to Frank, back to Rocky. It's just, it's very intentional and incredibly unpleasant to watch once you, once you have eyes on it. There, there's nothing organic about it. I, I like his jowls moving while he's singing. He really gets that, uh, like, I don't know. Gets his whole face shaking. Yeah, Lyndon Johnson style. I do like that Dr. Scott has this wonderful moment where he's serving a lot of face, but at least at our show, we kind of completely disregard it. As we kind of went into it, we're hurting cats a little bit at this point in the show, so it's kind of a... Uh less serious moment although we did we did take it pretty seriously at the halloween show that was a cool thing that we did with the table yeah and on lots of casts they do take it seriously and get the audience enjoying the the time that we have together in different ways particularly if you don't have an underwear run you yeah. you have a lot of opportunity during this to uh, to do the hand drive from Greece. <laughs> yeah. I was about to be like, show us, Leandra, but... I'm yeah. doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I just, I just uh, did a backflip. I just did a backflip. You guys don't know. Yeah, no. my titties are out. I mean, I we knew know that. that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, it, you have a lot more opportunity to do something interesting with this dinner scene if you don't have an underwear run if you have an underwear run at this point you're pretty much that's what you're doing right yeah. now or the and the audience is not watching you anymore so although i've been to shows where they have an underwear run but they don't warn anybody about it and it's only the regulars that do it i we don't have enough regulars to have that be a thing but <laughs> it is kind of wild that all of a sudden, for no reason that people would would know, people would just get up naked and go chasing after somebody. <laughs> I feel like as a virgin, that would be an intensely strange thing to understand. And fun. Yeah. Yeah, if you just have, like, one regular in the audience that takes on, like, a more sinister quality. <laughs> <laughs> running at Frank like a or Janet like a badass. <laughs> yeah. But those are all my notes. All right. Should we move on to callbacks? I think we shall. Brad, 
Do you know any callbacks for this minute? I was really racking my brain, and I think there's that one part where you go, oi, 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 and that's, that's it. And that's, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact line, and I'm, I'm blanking on it's, the lyrics. It is, of course, after he says, he was a low-down, cheap little yeah. punk. Yeah, everyone should chant, oi, oi, oi. Uh, for me, something that happens throughout this song that has intensely irritated me since I was a kid is um, after every like line that Scott says for no reason other than I guess to have something to say. Uh, it, it'll so like he says from the day he was born, not the night, but the day. He was trouble, not monopoly, but trouble. He was the thorn, not the rose, but the thorn in his mother's side, not the front, but the side. She tried in vain, not the artery, but the vein. And they do it later, too. I, I, I just have never liked it, but it's, I do appreciate that there's not a whole lot to go off here, so people are doing what they have to. Uh, and then after he says, but he never caused her nothing but shame, it's typical to chant, shame, shame, shame. Uh, and then the only one, other one I have is just um, right before the music picks up, and just pick up the pace. That's it. When you say it with the, with the beat of the song, it sounds nice, but... So I've got a couple more. When I first started doing Rocky, I was a Transylvanian often, and on this cast, it was the Transylvanian's responsibility to get people hyped up to do the hand drive. So there were little hand movements for not the night, but the day with a pop bubble was what we said instead of not Monopoly, but trouble. Mm. And then every rose has its thorn instead of not the rose, but the thorn. And then... Instead of not the back, but the side, a lot of people would say, and I don't understand why, they would just start screaming, Britney Spears must die. And then somebody else would go, leave Britney alone. And I, I get that mm -hmm. part of it. Because, yeah. yeah, like the leave Britney Chris alone. Chris Crocker. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. But I don't know why Britney had to be involved in this to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to guess, I would say it's probably similar to the Madonna thing in that she was popular at the time and people were just saying her name with for no particular reason. That's fair. That's my guess. I genuinely have no idea though. I've never even heard that. It's because anytime I consider saying it, I go, Wow, people don't need to know how old I am. <laughs> It's funny because it has looped it has looped back around, but that Britney Spears is pretty relevant again. But you don't want to you don't want to malign her in public. No. So. Although it was a choice for her to release the the female version of the Man Inside Me by Tobias Funke as her. I cannot <laughs> believe she named it that. <laughs> Because if, if any Arrested Development fans in the audience must have been as shocked as I was when <laughs> Britney Spears... What, I think it's literally called The Woman Inside, or it's like The Woman in Me or yeah. something, right? Insane. <laughs> I have a couple more callbacks. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of these are kind of going in rhythm with the with the lyrics or at least the music. So uh, it goes, Shabop, Shabop, Scott. All he wanted was Dr. Scott's cock. It was rock and roll porn. And then you see, hi, mom. Uh, it's the porn mag. And then uh, Krim flips the page and you go, hi, sis. And Dr. Scott goes, <laughs> on the motorbike. And you go, ooh, woo. And then he shoot it up junk. 
you go, give me junk, give me junk, or give me drugs, give me drugs, if you think that people don't know that junk is heroin. And then mm. when you see the, uh, when you see Eddie and you see that he's got a prisoner number, it's 274-306, that you scream, 274-306, and then that goes into the, oi, oi, oi. Oh, fun. Is that yeah. number a reference to anything, or is that just... It it appears to be random digits. If somebody knows something that I don't about it, you should leave us a five-star review and tell us. It is Leandra's ATM pen. <laughs> yes, all four <laughs> digits, but is, you're going Kelly's, to have to guess which ones. It's Kelly's body count. Yeah. That's a low number. Those are rippy numbers. <laughs> so it's a low uh, estimate. This isn't really slut shaming. This is like. Yeah, no, I'm proud of this. Yeah. I want them to see. <laughs> but that's all I got. Alright. Well. So. Now. You don't no. have, to, have go to go home, home but, you but you can't. Stay, but you can't here. stay here. here. So get the fuck out. Get the fuck out. To the late night, double feature, picture show.